again, everyone, and welcome to Cotton Grower Magazine's Cotton Companion Podcast. From coast to coast across the cotton belt, growers are getting ready for harvest and ginning season, and the crop is really trying its best to be ready as well if we could just keep some pesky rains out of the forecast. It's looking pretty good right now, but it's tough to make up two to three weeks of maturity at this point in the year. But right now, it's looking like a real busy October and November for a lot of cotton growers. I'm Jim Stedman, Senior Editor of Cotton Grower, and as always, joined by Cotton Grower Editor Frank Giles. Frank, what's new today? Oh, not much. Just watching uh, the cart cotton harvest get prepared to start rolling. You mentioned the rains. I know some of the growers up there, up there in Georgia are needing to dry out. Uh, Carolinas look a little little better shape for that. So I uh, just need some dry weather here for, for a stretch and, and keep it warm. Yeah, we just we just come through a couple couple days of light rain uh, in the mid south, depending on where you're standing, of course. But uh, but now we got some cooler temperatures, and I'm sure that that's not exactly the recipe that growers have been looking for to finish his crop out. Uh, we need dry and hot for for a couple more weeks. So anyway, that's that's all part of the cotton business. And uh, speaking of business, today we welcome a new sponsor to the Cotton Companion, uh, the folks at First Fire Safety. And they have a message they'd like to share with you right now. First Fire Safety is a fire protection company based out of Austin, Texas. We have developed a foam fire suppression system specifically designed to protect the John Deere round bale cotton harvester. We install this system and train operators all over the world. Be fire ready with a First Fire Safety fire suppression system. Call today for more information and pricing. 512-777-1555. Well, today, as we do every few episodes, we swing our focus back to cotton economics and, and more specifically, how the market's shaping up as we enter harvest and what factors may need a kind of a close eye when you're planning for 2022. So joining us today in the Cotton Companion virtual studio to answer some of those questions is Dr. Aaron Smith. He's Associate Professor and Cotton Economist with the University of Tennessee. I heard a presentation from him several weeks ago, and I think you're going to find what he has to share very, very interesting. So stay tuned. But there is a little bit of news in the cotton industry. So Frank, where do we stand right now with crop progress? Reports on open bowls jumped 12 percentage points in the past week as the U.S. cotton crop continues to mature. According to USDA's September 19 crop progress report, open bowls are now reported in 48% of the nation's cotton fields, just five percentage points behind the five-year average for this week. The biggest weekly gains in the report came from Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Virginia, and California. Harvest continues to move slowly, not unexpected, considering that most of the U.S. crop is still two to three weeks behind normal schedule. The report shows that 9% of the U.S. crop has been harvested up four percentage points in the past week, with Texas and Arizona continuing to lead the way. Crop conditions remain relatively stable, with 64% of the crop rated good to excellent, 28% fair, and 8% poor to very poor. And we want to pay our respects to the family of Billy Denovan, a true cotton industry giant who passed away on September the 11th at age 88. Donovan assumed management of his family's cotton business in his late 20s and grew it from a merchant row on Front Street in Memphis into a global powerhouse in cotton marketing. Yeah, it's, uh, I think anybody who's been involved in, in the cotton business and especially those of us who live here and work here in, in the Memphis area, uh, certainly know, know of Billy. Uh, some of us know him very well, not myself, uh, but we've all had a, had a chance to, uh, to cross paths with him and, and see the, the immense amount of uh, influence that he's had on the cotton business. He, he truly was one of those people where, where legend and reality were pretty much the same thing. Uh, he was the guy, the industry driver that basically kicked open the door to the China market uh, after the Nixon administration established relations with China back in 1972, and his firm did millions, if, if not billions of dollars in business with the Chinese through the early 2000s. Uh, 
obviously the Memphis newspapers have been covering covering his uh, his passing quite quite uh, well here in the past week. And one of the comments I thought uh, in the business news was was especially accurate. There is no international market for U.S. cotton without Billy Donovan. Uh, during most of the 1970s and 1980s, and Frank, I know you've seen this this too. Uh, Billy handled the annual Cotton Outlook presentation at the Mid South Farm and Gin Show. And when he finished his presentation, the rush out of the room to the payphones in the convention center lobby was was something to see. You just didn't want to be standing beside the door, or you know, in front of a door because you would get trampled. Uh, as folks literally were scrambling to call their merchants or brokers. Uh, I've heard several people say that he was the only person that could step onto the trading floor of the New York Cotton Exchange and cause cotton prices to rise. That's funny. I'll tell a funny story about his uh, market outlook. Um, one time we had an editor, a new, uh, relatively new editor that was at Cotton Grower who um, I advised, I told her, I said, you might want to record this presentation because he rattles off you know, a lot of information pretty quickly. And, and she insisted that she would be able to keep up just taking notes by hand. And I was watching, watching and about five minutes into the presentation, I saw the recorder coming out because there was just no way, <clears throat> no way to keep in, uh, keep ahead of that because he, he rattled off those numbers and outlooks with no notes. And uh, it was just all, yeah, it was always impressive. No notes. Everything, everything right off the top of his head. Yeah. The other side of uh, Billy from, you know, from a, a philanthropist perspective, and, and here certainly here in the Memphis area, he was a major uh, supporter of any number of civic school or, or health related activities. Uh, people have also described him as a fierce competitor who hated to lose at anything, uh, especially tennis. That was sort of his, uh, his pet sport and he was the driving force behind getting uh, some major tennis events moved to the Memphis area. Uh, for those of us of a certain age who remember the USFL uh, back in the early 1980s, he was the owner of the Memphis Showboats, which I still think is one of the greatest sports teams name in, uh, in, in history, regardless of, of what league it is. And he was also actively involved in the drive uh, to join the NFL when it expanded uh, to add Jacksonville and Carolina. I think uh, Memphis finished a, a close third in that, uh, in that race. But uh, Billy will certainly be remembered in Memphis for his generosity and his business drive and, uh, and throughout the global cotton community is one of its true giants. Yes, he will. It's quite a, quite a legacy. Definitely. So with all this discussion about international markets for U.S. cotton, it's only appropriate that we welcome Dr. Aaron Smith, Associate Professor and Cotton Economist with the University of Tennessee to the Virtual Cotton Companion Studio. Aaron, thanks for taking time to join us today and welcome to the Cotton Companion. Anytime, thank you very much, Jim. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, Aaron, our paths have crossed several times over the past few years since you joined the faculty at, at Tennessee. And, and like me, you kind of have a non-traditional background when it comes to the cotton industry. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you ended up in Knoxville and, and kind of what you're responsible for on an everyday basis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I'm not originally from the South. So, you know, learning about cotton and, and uh, the uniqueness of how that crop is, is marketed and, uh, and the production practices was a, a reasonably steep learning curve. Um, I did come from, from the University of, of Arkansas, where I did my, my graduate work. So I did my master's and my PhD there. And that was kind of my first exposure to cotton and cotton marketing. Uh, once I completed my PhD, I ended up uh, coming to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, my uh, responsibilities there revolve around risk management and marketing for our primary row crops. So I do cover cotton in addition to corn, soybeans, and, and wheat. Uh, and then I also do get involved in, in in domestic policy. And, and what I mean by that is typically your, your title one farm bill programs and crop insurance, which, you know, there's a fair amount of overlap there with, with kind of marketing strategies and making sure that we're, we're managing risk, or at least trying to mitigate some of that risk. Um, when we're looking at producing uh, crops and having, you know, the tools necessary for our, our producers and an understanding of those tools to, to try to end up, you know, making sure that they're, they're not exposed to undue risk. All right, well, let's let's get started here. The uh, the latest USDA supply demand report that came out on September 10th 
showed some higher projections for U.S. production, exports, and carryover. And normally that might be a little bit bearish for the market, but it doesn't seem to have impacted cotton prices at all. What's keeping this market propped up right now in the, into bullish territory? Well, I, I think there's a, a few different things there. Um, the first one is I think there was some of that already that was priced into the market, right? There was an anticipation that there was going to be a little bit higher production. Um, you know, Texas, the crop is looking reasonably good out there. At least we don't have the, the drought concerns that we've had in, in past years. So I think there's an expectation that we'd see some increased um, production there. There's also a, a risk premium that's in there. You know, obviously storm season is, is incredibly important for cotton and particularly with how um, a lot of the Delta cotton in particular is, is a few weeks behind where it would normally be in terms of major, uh, maturity. I think that that's an, another one where there's still an added um, uncertainty there. The other one that if you look at, as you look on, on kind of the demand side and the world stocks number, that actually did end up shrinking, right? So even though we had US production that went up and we had a little bit of a bump in our in our US ending stocks, we had actually a bigger drop in in foreign ending stocks. And so, you know, there's always always multiple moving components um, when we look at these these reports. And it's it's usually a combination of what the numbers are, what the expectation of the numbers were, and then how the markets position themselves post report. Last time we saw each other, we were in uh, in Jackson, Tennessee at the at the recent UT, UT Cotton Field Day. And mentioned in your presentation, you mentioned that now is really a good starting point for growers to uh, to maximize returns and reduce risk. Can you explain that just a little bit? Yeah, you know, one one of the ones that, that we always talk about on the marketing side, and I, I think I use the analogy of, of poker, right? Um, you're kind of dealt the hand that you get, right? And so we, we we're price takers in, in agriculture. This isn't unique to, to cotton, but we have to come up with the best strategy possible to play that hand. And one of the things that we see right now with with cotton prices um, on the December still above 90 cents, um, you know, we're in the upper 90th percentile of where prices are typically, right? So taking advantage of those prices, I think, is just just essential, right? There's still some production risk. We could see quality or, or losses because of, of storms, that type of stuff. Um, but, you know, trying to manage that risk and come up with a strategy where we can kind of maximize those prices. And it can be a combination of different marketing tools um, across the cotton belt. Different regions use different tools to market their, their crops. One that I'm a, a big proponent of right now, uh, more kind of on the, on the nearby contracts than some of the deferred because of the premiums associated with it, is using uh, option strategies. Uh, what that allows you to do is to remove some of that downside price risk and potentially end up. Um, you know, participate if you do sell um, your crop in, 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 a, in a rally down the road. And so, you know, it's just taking those prices, taking a look at where we are, have some historic context. Obviously, the other one that's so important for producers, because everybody's cost structure is, is very different, is seeing where you are relative to the inputs you've put into this crop. At 90 cents, um, the vast majority of producers, if they are near where their typical yields are, there's some profit to be had right there. And just being able to capitalize on that opportunity or take some of the risk off the table, um, I think is just really, really important, right? Um, you know, it's not to say that it doesn't come at a cost. Um, risk management is, is a cost uh, in order to use some of these tools. And so, you know, it's just, a, again, it's about taking uh, what the market uh, is offering and using the strategy that allows you to uh, best manage the risk for your operation. Aaron, throughout the price movement through the 80 and 90 cents levels, demand has remained strong on a global basis. During your uh, field day presentation, you asked the question, are we replacing past demand, meeting current demand, or borrowing, borrowing from future demand? What do you mean by that? Yeah, this, this is one, and, and you know, I don't have a, a great answer on this. This is just one that, that we've kind of been mulling around uh, with a few colleagues across across the region. Um, you know, obviously demand has been been fantastically strong. We've seen export purchases, uh, you know, starting all the way back in, in August of 2020, where we really started the, the, the increase in, in, uh, in prices. Um, if you remember back to when the, the COVID issue first reared its head, what we ended up seeing was kind of a, a, a substantial supply chain disruption, and it probably affected cotton more than most of our other row crops. And because it ended, ended up affecting the retail side, in addition to, um, you know, the, the producer and the, the movement of raw cotton. And so what I mean by, by is it 
um, filling the void left by by past demand, current demand, or future demand, is there was kind of a void in the supply chain that was created when everything kind of got shut down, right? And then, you know, we started to slowly see that fill back in. And then once we came out of a lot of the lockdowns, we've seen fantastically strong consumer demand for um, apparel and for retail, and that's actually continued. Um, the question that 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 I have is, there's been a huge rush to end up getting cotton into the supply chain. Have we overexerted those purchases so that we have an, a more than what we maybe typically would have in the pipeline, so to say? And will that affect the ability for some of the the mills to end up continuing to purchase at the same same levels? Um, you know, demand is is the real positive story, but I just wonder when we look at it, particularly as we get into 2022, do we not see a little bit of maybe a pullback as the the, the supply of cotton works its way through that that supply chain? Okay. Well, speaking of 2022, uh, you know, we're sitting here right now at, as harvest is getting ready to begin, already taking place in South Texas, but for the vast majority of the cotton belt, it's getting ready to start. Uh, so we're already looking ahead to next year. Uh, this year, we heard reports of, of seed and chemical shortages, uh, equipment availability, fuel prices, uh, a lot of other factors. Uh, what things should growers be taking into consideration now and preparing for from both a production and marketing perspective? Yeah, you know, this is this is one of my biggest concerns as we we enter this this fall and winter is is the rising input prices, right? Because one of the ones that, that I always remind um, our, our producers is we, we don't farm for price, we farm for profitability, right? And so if we see fertilizer prices have, have pretty much doubled um, compared to, to year ago levels, um, input and availability in terms of equipment and parts is a problem. Labor is well-documented in, in being incredibly expensive if you can get it. There's trucking, there's logistics issues that all adds to cost, right? The challenge that we have um, on the input side of things is there's actually pretty limited um, ways to mitigate that risk, right? You can forward purchase inputs, but you're still subject to what the prices are, right? We have more tools available at our dis disposal as producers to manage the output price risk rather than the input price risk. And so one of the ones that I think is really imperative is to look at those opportunities. And it, the only way that you can do it is really work the numbers for your individual operation is to see where um, you are at in terms of your input cost structure, and then how does that um, translate into what that price you need to end up getting under some reasonable yield assumptions uh, to get a, get a profitable opportunity? Because the one that, that, you know, when we look at kind of a historical context, um, you know, uh, the December 2022 contract has come down a little bit, but it's still above 80 cents. And once you're in that uh, 84 cent range, you're still talking about the 85th percentile in terms of prices um, as we're moving forward. So, again, when you're in that top 15 percent of prices historically since 2000, you know, taking some of that risk off the table may be an appropriate course of action, particularly with the potential for much higher input prices. Um, so when we look at that, you know, my biggest concern is that we don't price um, or take some of that price risk off the table for the 2022 crop. We see all these expensive inputs go into, into the ground and into producing that crop. And then we see a pullback in, in cotton prices. And then you would see some potentially really big losses in terms of of having expensive inputs and then lower commodity prices. Looking, uh, looking ahead or, or kind of looking at, at current market situation right now and, and global situations. I know there's some factors out there that, uh, that are causing, giving Wall Street a little bit of a headache and heartburn right now. Uh, how could that impact cotton? And really and truly, what, what do you see happening maybe for some of the export markets as we move ahead? Yeah, I mean, it, it, exports are so important for cotton. Um, you know, we export approximately 85% of the, the crop. So, I mean, we're, we're really subject to, to global influences, which are incredibly unpredictable. All you have to do is look at the Evergrande situation that's going on right now. Um, it has the, the potential to create some pretty big ripples in terms of the global economy. Hopefully that's not the case. Um, but again, it's, it's protecting against those types of events, right? There's nothing that we can do um, on the farm side of things about those types of, of, of things. And, and so it's, again, it's about managing what you can manage, right? So trying to end up using the tools that are available, 
um, through price risk management, crop insurance policy, those types of things to help um, manage risk for your operation. The other one that, that does kind of concern me a little bit when we're, we're looking into, into the future is, is kind of where we see exchange rates at. Um, it's often uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say ignored, but it, it's underappreciated the importance of exchange rates between different countries as to where they might end up sourcing some cotton. Obviously, there's there's production um, concerns. You have to have the supply to be able to to export it. But, you know, there is a, a, a substantial amount of, of what I would lump into a broad category of global uncertainty. And that can include the geopolitics of it, which is again, completely outside the control of, of, of the producer. Um, you know, just the, the COVID-19 pandemic that it rears its, its, its head and we, we end up seeing um, other parts of, of the globe where, where it pops up and uh, affects uh, global economic growth. You know, th there's some issues there. The other big one that is is on everybody's mind that has been discussed extensively is is in inflationary pressures, right? And so, you know, there's a whole basket of these these things that are completely outside of the grower's purview in terms of how to manage that risk. And so, you know, it's it's important to recognize those, but also to develop strategies that can be implemented at the farm level to help take some of that risk off the table. You're never going to be able to get into a into a risk free environment. You know, it's just the nature of, of farmer farming. We're always going to end up having weather risk, price risk, global risk, um, but trying to end up doing the best you can with with the tools that you have is so, so imperative right now. Great. Well, one la one last question. If, if, if there are any growers out there that don't have their crop the 2021 crop all settled and, and marketed and they know what they're going to do with it. Uh, what advice would you give them right now? You know, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of, of taking, um, you know, that price risk off the table. So, I mean, you know, uh, my, my father, he's an old farmer and he always said, there's, there's one thing that you always want to, you either want to have the crop or you want to have the money in, in your, in your pocket. And I think right now is the time where I'd rather have the money in the pocket than the, 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 the crop. So, um, I would, I would be encouraged to, to sell. And, and, you know, if you are, because, you know, up until about a month ago, I was actually pretty, um, I would have given it a 50, 50 shot that we would have hit a dollar cotton. Now I'm probably, you know, less than 25% that we'll get back up there, probably closer to 10%. I don't think we're going to, we're going to necessarily have the horsepower to get up, up that direction. So, you know, taking, taking that 90, 90 cents, um, you know, I think that's a pretty, pretty strong move, particularly when you start looking at some of the yields that we have, there's profit there for, for a vast majority of people. Definitely. What, what, what our listeners can't see is all three of us sitting here nodding our heads in agreement on that. So anyway, this seems like a pretty good place to, to wrap up today's discussion, sort of on a high note. And so Aaron, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today on, on the Cotton Companion. And we look forward to getting together again real soon. Anytime. Thanks a lot, Jim. And, and, and thank you, Frank, as well. I appreciate anytime you guys uh, love to, to have a conversation. I'm always available. Sounds great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Thanks. And that's it for this episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. A special thanks to our sponsor, First Fire Safety, for their support. And as always, thank you, dear listeners, for joining us. If you like what you hear on the Cotton Companion, please be sure and spread the word and tell your farmer friends about this podcast. Here's where and how they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, The Cotton Grower E-News, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. Cotton Companion Podcast comes to you twice monthly. It's produced by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues at the World Headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. My name's Jim Stedman. His name's Frank Giles. And we'll be back with you in two weeks with the next episode of The Cotton Companion. Until then, stay safe. And it works, and it works, and it works all